Good evening girls. Um, so today we will study on this late blight disease of potato. So this is another very common disease of not only potato but of all the crops belonging to Solanaceae family. Uh, even the tomato plant if you see it, it, it usually get affected so much by this disease both the early blight and the late blight disease so to, uh, yesterday we had studied on the early blight now this late blight disease of potato it is uh, causes blight symptom okay it causes blight symptom which appears towards the middle to late in the season okay middle to late in the season of the growing crop that is of the potato crop that is why it is referred to as a late blight whereas the early blight which we have studied yesterday that one it appears towards as early as compared to the late blight disease so these two different disease they are the blight disease they are referred to as the early and the late blight okay because the late blight it occurs it appears towards the late season whereas the early blight it appears towards the early season okay of the growing tomato plant now this is the disease which i had said that it caused uh, diseases in it has affected many of the solanaceous crops okay so here we will be talking only about the disease which uh, occur in the potato crop so here the host is the solanum tuberosum okay the solanum tuberosum that is the potato and the symptoms of the late blight also they can be seen on the foliage leaves as well as in the tubers so this disease you need to know that the pathogen which caused this disease is different from the one which caused the early blight if you remember the early blight is caused by alternaria solanae Whereas the late blight is caused by a pathogen, Phytophthora infestans. Okay, Phytophthora infestans, it causes late blight disease in potato. So let us study the symptoms. Let us see, let us take a look at the symptoms on the foliage leaves. Now the symptoms, they appear as hydrotic areas with indefinite margins either at the apex or at the edges of the leaflets okay and the infected regions they gradually turn brown to black okay they either turn brown to black due to necrosis and this in this case in this figure what you see here it is the early stage okay the early stage of the disease now in the early stage of the disease what you observe here the chlorotic border you can see here where the this brown symptoms appear you can see this chlorotic border develops around the necrotic region chlorotic meaning a condition in which the leaf it produces insufficient chlorophyll that's why you can see here it turns yellow so these symptoms they are surrounded by these chlorotic borders you can see here in all these symptoms okay so these indicate the early symptoms of the disease and the necrotic region meaning the region where the leaf has become death okay it has become death now the leaf during moist weather the disease it progress very rapidly okay it progress very rapidly and it 
causes more much decay of the infected region and also it produces a characteristic bad odor now you can see here in the when this disease it has become uh, it is becoming uh, much bigger okay this is the early stage and this is the late stage of the disease here what do you observe that uh, in this case especially during moist weather just like the early blight a moist weather always uh, is the favorable condition of almost of most of the plant pathogens okay so here for this plant pathogen also a moist weather is a favorable condition for the disease to uh, develop so during moist weather the disease it progress very rapidly and it cause decay to the infected region okay so here the moment you see these brown spots you should be able to differentiate okay between the early blight and the late blight now in case of late blight what do we observe here around these necrotic areas that is the the where the symptoms appear on the leaf you can see they have these chlorotic border okay this yellow border yellowish border Whereas in the case of early blight, if you have seen yesterday, if you remember that the leaf, it becomes yellow all over, okay, near all these symptoms. There is no border around these. There is that chlorotic border is not, does not occur only around the symptoms. But the leaf itself, in most of its part, it becomes yellow, okay, the infected leaf. So that is the difference. And another difference is that yesterday you you have seen that these symptoms of alternaria sulanae that is the early blight they are restricted to the veins okay they did not grow beyond these veins of the leaf the leaf veins okay you can see here clearly that they are restricted to these veins whereas in the case of late blight you can see here that it has spread so much as in this figure you can see it has spread so much and the spot here it has become bigger much more bigger and it is not restricted by the veins of the leaf you can see these are the leaf veins here so this the symptoms this disease they are not restricted to the leaf veins okay and also one more thing how you will differentiate between these two symptoms is that in case of late blight, you can see here uh, the whitish, some whitish mycelium, okay, appear around this um, symptoms. This infected part of a leaf, you can see there is a whitish mycelium. But sometimes when this symptom, when this part of a the leaf infected part it becomes very dry then you can just see a brown spot okay it is and it is very very similar to the uh, spot of the of the early blight alternaria solanae so sometimes people they get confused so you should uh, be able to identify so you should remember that the alternaria solanae disease that is the early blight caused by alternaria solanae how you will remember that they are restricted to the veins and you can find those concentric rings okay the concentric rings whereas in the case of this late blight caused by phytoptera infestans those concentric rings are absent so these are the symptoms on the foliage leaf of the potato plant. So this one, the during just remember that during moist weather, okay, which is a favorable condition for the disease to occur to develop, this disease it progresses very very rapidly and causing much more decay, and the the sporangia. Okay, the sporangia, they are visible as matty growth. You can see these whitish mycelium, okay, growth on the lower surface of the leaflet. 
and also what happened in the moist weather condition this disease it will spread very rapidly okay and it the entire plant it may be damaged completely within just few days whereas during the dry weather condition the this disease it will progress very very slowly okay and the affected region as in this case okay the infected region uh, when the weather is very dry you can see that the this the leaf part okay the foliage leaf where the infection occurs it will curl and shrivel okay and the disease okay the symptoms the disease which occur in this foliage leaf it will become hard okay it will become hard and it will be uh, it and easily break with just a small disturbance okay due to wind or if you happen to touch this part the infected part okay it will become it will break okay due to disturbance so that occurs in the dry weather condition that is the cause the disease is um it progresses very slow in dry condition whereas during moist weather condition the disease it progress very rapidly so we will uh, now take a look at the symptoms in the tubers okay in the tubers the pathogen it does not go down through the stem to the tuber remember this because even the stem and the tuber they get infected but this disease it will not go down through the stem because we know that the potato tubers they are inside the soil right so the 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 tuber infection it takes place in different ways it's not through the stem but in different ways now during the growing season okay during the tomato growing season the hydrotic areas they develop on the tuber surface okay they develop on the tuber surface and the regions okay the regions where the the hydrotic areas they develop on the tuber surface and regions become necrotic okay it will become necrotic that part where the pathogen is infected now if the condition favors this entire potato it will become damaged completely before harvest okay that is during moist weather condition okay when the temperature and humidity is favorable for the growth of the pathogen then uh, the whole potato tubers may become damaged now the disease can also be spread during harvest now during harvest harvesting period the tuber with delicate skin which have a delicate skin they may become ruptured and in some way the the ruptured tuber okay the tuber where the skin has become ruptured it may come in contact with the infected leaf okay when they come in contact with the infected leaf now we know that the spores from from here they have come in contact with the tubers during harvesting period so those spores they will start to develop in the tube the disease will start to develop okay the spores will start to uh, divide and they will cause disease okay now later the symptom is visible just after cutting the tuber and you can see somewhat like as a wheel okay a wheel here marked by small brown dots when you cut the potato tuber okay the symptom is visible after cutting the tuber as a wheel marked by small brown dots so these are the symptoms on the potato tuber you can see here when the disease you can see when the disease it has progressed okay in the lower part of the leaf you can see that the leaf they become curled this is during dry weather condition the leaf they become curl and they will break they will easily break okay with just a small disturbance they become hard in this region 
in this part infected by the pathogen. So now let us uh, study, let us take a look at the causal organism, okay, that is the Phytophthora infestans. Now the causal organism, okay, the Phytophthora infestan, it belongs to the division Eumycota, okay, and the plant body is Cenocytic Mycelium, okay, it is Cenocytic Mycelium, Cenocytic, it means having many nuclei okay that is a multi-nucleate cell so the mycelium of this fungi it has a multi it is a multi-nucleate having many nuclei okay so the these mycelium they grow in the intercellular spaces as well as intracellularly meaning they grow in the spaces between the cells as well as within the cells so they grow both intra and intercellularly now the sporangiophores you can see here these are the sporangiophores okay these are known as the sporangiophores sporangiophores meaning the specialized hypha the hypha which bears the sporangia Okay, so these hypha are termed as the sporangiophores. So these, the sporangiophores, okay, that is the hypha, they develop either singly or in groups on the young seedling. And they also form from the lower side, okay, they form from the lower side of the leaf of an adult land as in this case many sporangiophore you can see here they develop from the lower side of the leaf now these this sporangiophore that is these hypha they are branched okay you can see here this is a single hyph this hypha here is very branched it is branched and they develop these what we call the sporangia okay they they develop sporangia at the apices so you can see here in this figure b many sporangia are developed on the apices of these sporangiophores initially just one sporangio sporangium it developed at the apex okay so just take a look at this figure now you can see here a single sporangium it developed at the apex of these sporangiophores but at maturity the sporangiophores they elongate okay they elongate from one side and they will you can see here they elongate from one side and they will push okay they will shift the sporangium towards the opposite side and then another sporangium here will develop so you can see in this figure b many sporangium develop on the apex of these sporangiophores so it is in inside these sporangiums that the spore will form okay the spore will form inside these sporangium now the sporangia if you just take a look at a single sporangia they are lemon shaped okay if you uh, observe this inside the microscope you will see that these they these uh, sporangia they are lemon shaped and also they are colorless so let us see yes this is the microscopic slide okay of the phytophthora infestin you can see that they are uh, they are lemon shaped and also they are colorless and also they have a small stalk below and just take a look at the apex of these sporangia you can see a small protuberance okay a small protuberance in this case as well you can see here just above this sporangia lemon shaped sporangia you can see these protuberance okay known as the papilla okay that is the small 
protuberance in the spore. Here a small rounded protuberance on this sporangium. So just remember that the spore they are lemon shear and they have the small protuberance known as the papilla and they are colorless and having a stalk. You can see the spore the sporan the sporangium they are having a stalk. So if you remember that when we study about these uh, mycelium, remember in the last uh, class when I had explained on the life cycle of Poxinia, I had shown to you those mycelium which have a septation and those which are not, okay, they do not contain any septation. So these sinusitic mycelium here, they you can see that there is no septation in between these uh, in these hyphae there is no septation so these type of mycelium they are referred to as sinusitic mycelium so this um, after now these uh, during favorable condition okay let us see during favorable condition these sporangium Okay, these sporangium which has formed in on these sporangiophores. So let us take a look at this figure V, a single sporangium. So during a favorable condition, these sporangium they produces a number of biflagellate. You can see here there are two flagella. Okay, biflagellate secondary zoospores. So these are the spores which are formed on these microsporangium during favorable condition. Now these zoospores, the biflagellate zoospores, after swimming for some time in dew drop okay, or thin film of water, the zoospore will, the zoospore insist, okay, insist meaning they are enclosed okay the zoo spore enclosed and then they will germinate they will germinate by producing germ tube you can see here they will germinate starts germinating and they will form the germ tube so the germ tube here okay when because we know that all these things they happen inside a hose here these you can see here in this figure the this is the section of the disease plant okay suppose it is the leaf the foliage leaf now this is the infected part so what happened after these sporangiophore they produce they form the sporangia then during favorable condition during we know that the favorable condition for the growth of this microbe is uh, uh, moisture with with high moisture content okay the higher humidity so these sporangiophores they will form these biflagellate zoospores and these biflagellate zoospores they will start to form to germinate and form germ tube so these germ tube then they will directly enter through the stomata Okay, they will enter the stomata and they will develop the appressorium. Okay, you, if you remember the the way these spores they infected the host is through the formation of the appressorium. So just to remind you what are appressorium, they are the structure which develop on the spores in order to help them to infect the host plant. Okay, so these appressorium are structures which develop on the on these spores in order for them to infect the host plant so they will pierce through the stomata and develop a pressurium at its tip okay as soon as they come in contact with the cell wall they they will start to penetrate the host wall by mechanical pressure now by mechanical pressure or by enzymatic modification if you remember i had uh, explained to you about this also that the pathogen uh, the the way in which the pathogen they causes infection in the hose 
is through enzymatic action okay by producing certain enzymes which will rupture the host epidermis okay so either by mechanical pressure or by producing these enzymes to rupture the host epidermis but what happened in unfavorable condition so during unfavorable condition these sporangium they will behave as conidium okay they will behave directly as conidium meaning they will behave directly as spores which germinate directly and producing the germ tube remember girls so here what happened in favorable condition these sporangiophores here let us take a look at the single sporangiophore it will produce the zoospores okay it will produce the zoospores then these zoospores they will germinate and infect the host but uh, what happened in unfavorable condition in unfavorable condition these spores will not be formed the zoospores will not be formed instead the the sporangium itself it will form as a conidium it will behave as a spore a conidium meaning a spore okay a spore that is asexually produced spores okay the asexual spore the conidium is the asexual spore and this conidium it will start to form to produce the germ tube and infect the host so uh, just remember this that the optimum temperature for the growth of the mycelium is 16 to 18 degree centigrade and for production of spores that is sporulation is 21 degree centigrade okay for the germination of the sporangia and the this the relative humidity okay of 100 percent it favors the abundant production of sporangium okay for the production of abundant um okay the sporangium here a uh, relative humidity of 100 percent favors the growth of these sporangium while below 90 percent okay 90 percent relative humidity it inhibits the production okay or the formation of these sporangium now the fungus is heterothalic okay what is heterothalic girls so this particular pathogen is heterothalic so heterothalic you remember girls like uh, in the case of poxemia the formation of basidiospores we have two genetically different um, types that is the positive and the negative types the spores and you have also seen during the formation of the pycneospores where the positive spore will interact with the negative receptive hypha and the negative spore will interact with the positive receptive hypha so that condition is referred to as heterothalic that means they are those species which require those which require mycelia of two different strains okay positive and negative to interact in order for a zygote to form a zygospore to form now here you can uh, we have seen that the sporange inside the sporangiopore the zoospore will develop in favorable condition or in unfavorable condition these sporangium itself they will form as the conidium okay the conidium that is the asexual spore now the O spore that is the spore which formed through the sexual um, reproduction between the oogonium that is the female and the antheridium that is the male okay they will fuse together to form the O spore O spore so here during the sexual reproduction the O spore is formed and the oospore they are produced in the aerial parts okay the parts of a plant which are exposed okay by the union of the ogonium 
and the antheridium. So this is the another type of spore which is formed, the sexual spore that is the oospore. So next we will study the life cycle. Okay, this is the picture I just want to show you of the infected phytophthora plant. You can see the how much damaged okay the tuber put the potato tuber it has become so much damaged by this pathogen and you can see these uh, mycelium whitish mycelium here inside when you cut the 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 whole tuber whereas this is the in the case of the potato tuber infected with alternaria solanae that is early blight you can see this corky tissue inside the potato tuber so these are the sporangium, sporangium which along with the sporangio 4 okay you can see the microscopic slide here so this is just to show you the difference where the for early early blight symptoms by alternaria solana you can see they are restricted to the veins this is the best picture which shows that these infected parts they are restricted by the veins of the leaf whereas these they can just spread everywhere okay this i will talk about this later we see here this is the oospore formation due to the fusion between the antheridia that is the male and the oogonium that is the female they fuse together to form the oospores now we will study the life cycle of the phytophthora of this pathogen its life cycle so let us study about the life cycle of this pathogen now in the dormant phase okay there are two phases okay the dormant phase and the active phase of this pathogen let me just show you this one there is a dormant phase of this pathogen and the active phase okay so in the dormant phase the fungus it could perineate in the tubers okay as mycelium okay it could perineate in the tubers as well as in plant debris so you can see here perineating mycelium in tubers and in plant debris so the disease cycle of this pathogen okay the disease cycle if you take a look it has the dormant phase and the active phase okay so in the dormant phase what happened the perinating mycelium is present in the tubers of the potato plant as oospores as as well as in plant debris so they are present in the tubers and in plant debris now in the dormant phase the dormant phase that means there the physiological functions of these spores of this fungi they are slowed down okay they are suspended or slowed down for a certain period of time okay so here in this dormant phase the mycelium are said to be perinating mycelium they can live through a certain they can live through a certain period with their physiological function suspended or slowed down so here during this time remember that this phytophthora infestants they are present in the tubers and in plant de debris as oospores i think you remember the oospores they are the sexual spores formed by the fusion of the male that is the ugonium or the female the ugonium and the male that is the antheridium so the oospore is formed now when the favorable condition is formed the during the favorable condition these perinating mycelium they will become active now okay so this is the dormant phase okay now when they become active during favorable condition 
the they these spores these ooze spores they will start to form mycelium you can see sporangia from the ooze spores they will produce freshly they will form from freshly produced mycelium so they will start to develop active mycelium these active mycelium they will then form the they will then form the sporangiophore okay again you can see here in this case they will start to form the sporangiophores along with the sporangia you can see these are the hypha that is the sporangiophore uh, bearing the sporangia at, uh, at the top so this is a single sporangium now on the other hand the oospore it will germinate okay on the other hand the oospore it will germinate by producing germ tube it will form the germ tube bearing sporangia so actually they either form the the active mycelium and they will these hypha they will bear the sporangiophores okay or the oospore that is this one okay so the oospore they will germinate okay forming the germ tube on the other hand they will germinate by producing germ tube bearing sporangia at their tip now in both the case in both these case what happened in both these case these sporangia which are formed from the mycelium as well as from the ooze spores you can see here sporangia forming from the ooze spores and the sporangia which form from the freshly produced mycelium so both these they will be dispersed by either the wind or the rain okay the wind or the rain will disperse these sporangia now these sporangia on when they come in contact with the hose they will start to germinate okay so sporangia they germinate in the water film and they will infect the hose Okay, the whole surface by producing the zoo spores. Okay, now they will start forming the zoo spores and cause infection to the host tissue. So the infected host again it will form sporangia and sporangiophore, and the sporangia they develop zoo spore which causes further infection of the plant. So this process it repeats several times. Now again the sporangia will form sporangiophores which on germination will infect the hose again and again will spread to other parts of the hose forming this secondary cycle. Okay that means the hose or uh, sorry the infection will spread to the leaf, the stem and finally also on the tuber. So this is referred to as the secondary cycles so now the mating between the compatible thalli okay that is the the ugonium and the antheridium okay the mating between the ugonium and the antheridium they will form again the oospores now these oospores okay during favorable condition the zoospores from here they may come down into the soil and cause infection on tubers now the tuber infection it may also takes place in contact with the foliage leaf as i had mentioned earlier that the that the tuber it either uh, get infected through the harvesting period during the harvesting period okay so the perinating mycelium inside the tuber it remains active if the tubers they are kept in storage Whereas in the next season, the seed, the perinating mycelium, it will again become active and causes further infection. So the cycle will repeat again and again. So towards the end of the season, inside the aerial part, both the sex organ, that is the male and the female, the antheridium and the ugonium, they will 
develop oospor okay so here in this case you can see here in this figure now these antheridia and ugonium they will fuse to form this oospor on they will undergo sexual reproduction of amphigynous type now why it is called amphigynous okay so the antheridium here if you take a look at the male the antheridia it is said to be amphigynous when it encircles the ugonial stalk you see here this is the ugonium and it is having a stalk so the antheridia here it encircles the stalk of the ugonia let me show you in this it is very clear you can see here this is the female that is the ugonia and th this is the antheridia you can see it encircles here at the stalk of the ugonium of the female so when they fuse together they form the oospore now the product of sexual reproduction is the oospore which has a hard protective covering so the oospore here it will remain dormant again inside the host tissue during unfavorable condition okay when these day uh, when mating occurs between these male and female uh, they will form the oospores and inside the tuber root they will remain dormant for certain period of time okay they will remain dormant inside the host tissue that is the tuber root so during favorable condition in the next season they will germinate when the favorable condition arrive that is when the planting season of potato again arrive on the favorable condition so they will germinate and produce next crop of zoo spores so so this is the last part okay we come to the last part that is the disease management so this disease it can be controlled or reduced through these methods okay the cultural method physical methods chemical methods and biological methods so the useful way for controlling the late blight potato through the cultural methods are these potato tubers okay they should not be collected from the disease field okay from the field where the, the disease occur so now fresh potato tubers should be used for another plantation crop okay for another plantation period okay the new tubers should be used and they should not be collected from the field where the tubers are already infected and the tubers they should always be uh, collected or harvested when the tubers are fully matured why because this will make the skin of the tubers become tough okay it will not be ruptured and because we know that when they are still young the skin is very soft and if it peel off and it will come in contact with the spores from the leaf or the stem or from the soil then they will get infected so the tubers should always be harvested after the maturity and also the while harvesting the aerial part that is the above part of the plant it should be completely dried okay the above part it should be completely dried because we know that moisture it favors the growth of these pathogens now the infected plants they should be cut out okay suppose these infected stems and the leaves they should be cut out and they should be buried in the deep in the soil to avoid the spread of the disease and the if there are any debris in the previous land okay those should be clean from the field before plantation of the new crop they should be clean and they must be burned outside the field and these they these uh, potatoes okay which may be harbor with infection they should be completely eradicated okay they should be they should be eradicated and the field in the field the potato tubers they they should be planting with the susceptible and resistant varieties okay those potato tubers which can resist the 
pathogen and these nitrogen fertilizers which are usually supplied to the soil they should be applied at a reduced rate in order to avoid the growth of the pathogen because a high nitrogen content in the soil it favors the growth of the pathogen and during harvesting both the plants the potato plants and the tubers they should always be kept separated on from each other okay so thereby the contact between the tubers and the plants they can be avoided so that any plant which is infected it might not come in contact with the tubers so next comes the physical method okay, by which the pathogen can be controlled in the physical methods we know that in these infected potato tubers we have the mycelium inside okay which perineate inside the potato tubers okay these perineating mycelium they can be killed by exposure of these potato tubers to 40 degrees centigrade for four hours and also they can be also killed these tubers which has infected by these perineating mycelium they can be killed by dipping the tuber in water at 45 degree for four to five hours or for 24 hours at 40 degrees centigrade this will kill all these uh, perineating mycelium they will be killed so that is the physical method now we come to the chemical method for chemical method uh, only three fungicides I have shown here but many fungicides have been used the name have been given in the notes you can study those and these fungicides some of these are Bordeaux mixture the meta lazel and the Dietian M45. These are the common fungicides which are used to kill the disease by spraying the fungicides in the plants. But we know that these uh, fungicides, they are very harmful to our system, right? The chemicals. So the alternative way is the use of the biological fertilizer. Now comes the biological method, okay, biocontrol. Here, I just want to show you this picture Okay, just to show the example, suppose this is the pathogen. Now, these are the two different organisms which are grown on a plate. Okay, this is an experiment in the lab where we see that when both the microbes, this fungi and this fungi, they are grown, they are provided with the nutrients and everything they need. We can see that this one, it inhibits the growth of this one. This one, it cannot grow further. Now, it's this fungi it stops the growth of this it inhibits the growth of this so this is the what we call the biocontrol and such organisms are termed as biocontrol agent now these they can be prepared or they can be made as organic biofertilizers instead of using these biofungicides then we can have this organic uh, fungicides instead of those chemical fungicides we can have these fungicides can be prepared from these microbes okay which can kill the pathogen in the field now last one we have the disease tolerant varieties that is the using of the disease tolerant varieties it is better to use the disease tolerant variety okay which uh, we can get these varieties which where we can get the disease free potatoes okay which cannot be infected by the pathogen so instead of using all those chemical fertilizers these disease resistance varieties they can be used and in india uh, they the central potato breeding station it has developed some tolerant varieties okay in india also we have these tolerant varieties so these can be grown in the field so that the fresh potatoes without disease they can be obtained